What a visitation. I just, I, I implore you to, to not take this for granted. Not, not everyone gets what you get on a weekly basis. God shows up here every week. Every week. God shows up in this house. And I know we have some other things we got to do tonight, and that's okay. But I just want to share a few things with you.
I stand here before you and I don't really know where to go with this because I, I feel like we're in a, has anybody ever been to the ocean, I mean the real ocean, not just with little big waves, but the real ocean when there's big waves. Yeah. I'm talking about the real ocean, I'm not talking about Gulf of Mexico, Gulf. I'm talking about the real ocean, right? Okay. Where you go and, and, and you swim out and you, you can ride them into the shore. You don't just kind of get out. You know, it's not like we're at Lake Texoma and the winds roll hard. I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about, have you ever been to where the ocean is roaring as it's coming in? And that's how I feel like right now is, is that we're in a period right now of where the Holy Ghost moved greatly and now we're waiting for the next set of waves to come in. Does that make sense? Yes. If you've ever seen the guys that surf, um, they, they paddle out and then they sit and they wait for their set of waves. Waves are always crashing in, but there's that one time when there's that really that good set of waves. They're, they're big and they're curling and they're, they're coming into the shore. And I feel right now in our, in our church service that we're in right now that we're kind of in between our waves. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this in between waves. And I don't feel like, the, I don't feel like God's done with what he was going to do, but I feel like we kind of took a breath. And so I'm just kind of just waiting. But we as a city, we are called to be that city. And Sister Martha was very accurate when she said that we were seasoned with salt. We were chosen by God to be in this place at this time. Can I share with you just a couple of things this morning, this, this evening, this, that, that, that God has called you for this time right now? Yes. Right now. Yes. You could have been dead years ago. But God called you for right now. Why? Why? Did you ever ask why? <laughs> I ask it all the time. Why? Why this calling, God? Why now? When it seems to be harder now to pastor a church than it's ever been, why call me to do it now? That's right. When, when folks used to have a fear of God. I said used to. Now we have sinned. The drop of a hat, and we'll drop the hat. We'll turn our back on God just as fast as we can because it's something I want to do. And I, and, I, and I say, God, why now? Why this time in my life? Why this, you know, I, I could have been dead when I was six. My appendix was bad. Took it out, I missed three months of school. I just had so much infection in my body. I could have died. Then, before that, I crawled out on a bed and the, and the screen latch hooked to my, my shirt and I was dangling above semen when I was about two years old. And my mom said, where's Jeff? And my brother found me dangling outside the screen, outside the I could have been dead then. Motorcycle wrecks, car wrecks, bicycle wrecks, sports, all those things could have been dead then. And I ask God, why now? Why me? Why now? When it seems to be the hardest time in history to get people to love God with everything that's in them. Because they're so distracted. Do you know that they, the, the statistic says now that our attention span is eight minutes? Eight minutes. You know why? Come on. This is why you're driving. Eight minutes. You'll notice the news cycle. Every eight minutes they tell the same story. Why? Because we don't understand it in eight minutes. Because yeah. we're on to the next thing. 
The attention span of, of the United States of America, uh, the Americans of the United States, are is eight minutes. Eight minutes. See, because some of you have already, you're about to die right now because you want to see the post with something on Facebook. But I'm going to miss it. Somebody's going to see it before I do. They're going to like something before I get to put hearts in a smiley face. I don't care if you're, if you're on Facebook. You just watch what you put on Facebook. Amen. Pastor Hilton said one time, some folks need to be slapped into Facebook. <laughs> I don't, just, just watch what you do on it. Have a little bit of sense. Don't blast people on Facebook. You, what are you, a junior high school kid? Amen.
Can I share my opinion of the modern church? I said a prayer, I'm going to live like hell and still be saved. I don't want to change anything in my life other than God to bless me. I want more money. I want a bigger house. I want a bigger car. I want a better job. I want new clothes. I want new shoes. I want new everything. But nothing in my life is better change. He better not ask me to drop anything. He better sure not ask me to change anything that I'm doing. And he better not ask me to do anything for him. Amen. But I want all things new, but I don't want anything old to pass away. I don't want my old, I don't want my old self to die. I just want new things from God. Well, that's just my personality. Lie of the devil. Lie of the devil. Conversion. Conversion doesn't mean stay the same. Repentance doesn't mean, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm blessed. That is not what God has called us to. He has called us to conversion, changing, change in our life. Something new out of something old. You cannot put new wine in old skins. You can't put new vision in old vessels. In old vessels. I sit here and I talk and I look at you and I, and I preach vision to you and some of you can hold it and some of you can't because your vision is still the same. It's still old. The vision is still old and you can't contain it and it bursts you. But hear me for a second. I still understand that salvation means a conversion, a change, a life-altering transformation in my life. It does not mean stay the same and get the blessings of God. Never has meant that. Never will mean that. But the modern church, as long as we get, get out in an hour and 15 minutes, that's all I want to hear. I don't want to tarry at an altar because that will take time. I don't want to have to, I don't have to humble myself and kneel down because I the ultimate. No, you're not. No, you are not. He is the ultimate. Everything. He is the one I kneel down to. I will not kneel down to men, but I will kneel down to God. I will pour my soul out to God. Behold, all things are new. All things are passed. Old things are passed away. Ezekiel 33, 2 through 16. We must be the trumpet blowers. Let's read that. Ezekiel 33, verse 2 through 16. I don't know if I'll read all of it. I'll read some of it. Son of man, speak to the children of the people. And say to them, when I bring a sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast, set him for their watchman. I think I, I remember preaching this one time. And I asked you, go back. And I asked you, listen to, the, listen to what it says. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, oh, this has been three or four years ago that I preached this, so we to, forgive me if I don't get it exactly right. When I bring the sword up uh, upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their own coast. Remember I preached to you that I was a man of your own coast? And set him for their watchmen. I see myself in this verse. Amen. Verse 3. And when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Come on. I don't know how, but it's me. It's, it's me. I'm from your own coast. I'm one of your own. I am the fruit of your labor. And I stand here and, I, and I'm trying to warn people. When I see the sword coming into the land. Verse 4. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh out the warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Verse 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet and he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Yes, amen. Six. 
But if the watchman see the sword come and blow out the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood shall I require. At the watchman's hand. Verse 7. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. Verse 8. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Verse 9. Nevertheless, if thou shalt warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he did not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Verse 10. I'm about done. Therefore, O thou, o thou son of man, speak to the house of Israel, thus you shall speak, saying, if our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Verse 11. Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that but the wicked turn from his way and live. Ye turn, ye turn from your evil way, for why shall ye die, O house of Israel? Come on, somebody. Verse 12. Therefore, thou son of man, say unto the children of thy people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him from the day of the transgression as for the wickedness of the wicked. He shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. Neither shall the righteous be able to live from his righteousness in the day that he sinneth. What does that mean? <coughs> Your righteousness can't do anything more for you than the wickedness of the sinner. Your righteousness. Not his righteousness. You have the same thing. You may be righteous and self-righteous. It does nothing for you, just like the wicked of the wickedness. Does, of the, the wickedness of the wicked does nothing for them. Verse 13. When I say, then when I shall say unto the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trust into his own righteousness and commit iniquity, all his righteousness shall be remembered. But for his iniquity that he hath committed, he shall die for it. What does that mean? I don't want anything to change in my life. I just want to look like I'm righteous. Don't ask me, God, to change my life. Don't ask me to do anything different than I'm doing now. I know it's a hard thing to hear. But if I don't stand here and tell you, your blood is required in my hand. I have to be a watchman on the wall. Verse 14. <laughs> Again, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, if he turn from his sin and do that which is lawful and right. Verse 15. If the wicked restore the pledge, give again that he had robbed, walk in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. What does that mean? Repent. Change your life. Do something different. Don't continue to do what you've always done and expect God to bless it. So long we have said, I'm going to live like I want to live. And God, you're going to bless it. And God's like, you are crazy. I will not bless sin. God will not bless sin in our lives. Are there some things that are, that are set in stone and God will bless you? Yes. If you're a tither, God is bound by his word to bless you. Well, he is. Because it doesn't, because tithing has nothing to do, well, tithing has, is a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing too, but you know what I'm saying. You can physically do it as well as spiritually. What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. If your heart's not right, most people won't tithe if their heart's not right. That's just, that's just how it is. They won't biblically tithe. They'll tip God, but they won't tithe. No. What do you mean? They, they won't give 10%. They'll give, eh, but they get full. Okay, I'm going. Verse 16 in our clip. None of his 
sins that he hath committed shall be mentioned unto him. He hath done that which is lawful in the, and right. He shall surely live. Yes. Amen. Okay. We must be a trumpet blower. We must sound the alarm. We are the watchmen of this city. We are the watchmen of this town, this city. We must sound the alarm and the city hears, we're saved. If we sound the alarm and the city hears, they are saved. If we sound the alarm and the city sleeps, we are saved from the judgment of God for those who did not heed the warning. We Listen, if we fail the sound of the alarm, we are guilty of the blood of the souls of the people that are in this city. We cannot make them hear. We cannot make them heed the warning. We can do nothing but sound the alarm and be the watchman on the low, on the tower and give peace to those of us who are sometimes watching over the city. What do you mean, Brother Jeff? Here's what I mean. Please understand what I mean, and I'll quit here in just a minute. We are that city set on a hill. Yes. We are to be the light. We are to be the salt. We are to be the salt of the earth and the light into the world. The salt gives flavor. The salt seasons. The salt keeps it in it. Uh, uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, 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 keeps it from rotting. What's that? Preserves. Preserves. Thank you. The salt holds fast those things which are alive. The light simply shows the way. The light runs out of, runs darkness out. The light shows up when darkness abounds. The light so much more abounds. But hear me for just a second. As the preacher said today, and, I, and it struck a chord with me. He said that he said that the church is down in attendance. While the earth and the world is going crazy. <clears throat> and he spoke this and it made sense to me. Maybe it doesn't make sense to you, but it made sense to me. He said, because the world has lost confidence that the church has the answer. What a sad commentary. That we are no longer the light, but just part of the darkness. That was worth the price of admission. That we are no longer the light of the earth, just part of the darkness. <laughs> Woo! That makes me mad. Amen. That we are no longer considered to have an answer. Because after all, to pray for somebody takes time. And I've got to get somewhere. 7.33 in the evening and I've got to get to Mazio's before 9. Uh -huh. I've got to go somewhere. Regardless, listen, I know you're having trouble, but we'll pray for you. Sure. And we don't think about praying for them for the next time we see them at Walmart. And we said a prayer real fast so we can don't, don't lie when we God pray for you. Uh, Huh. Can you listen? Can you imagine the security of knowing that someone's watching for an enemy attack? Hear me. I remember growing up in the church, and, and growing up in the church, I, I never, I never worried about anything. As far as I don't know why, I just didn't worry about stuff like you do. I, I believe that the saints of God were praying. I believe the pastor prayed, and I believe that my parents prayed. I never did worry about anything. I just, something happened with, with, with God. Anybody remember that? Maybe I grew up in the wrong house. We didn't. When, when something happened, we didn't run to Facebook and try to manipulate somebody into giving us something. We. Ran to God. Oh, and I said it right straight out loud, didn't I? <laughs> we went to God. We prayed. I know that's weird. We sought God. When we had a need on Sunday, you can bet Monday we fasted. I just grew 
grew up in another time. I'm just telling you, I'm an old throwback guy. I, I grew up in a time when it wasn't it wasn't a special thing to pray. It was the common thing to pray. Nobody was writing books about you gotta pray in the 70s. Because people prayed. Nobody's getting rich off of how to four ways to reach God in the 70s. Because we all knew how to get hold of God. We all prayed and sought His face. When there was a need in our life, we believed God for it. Now, what a security that was to know if I needed something, people were praying. But can you imagine? Can you imagine not having that security? We've lost the ability to sound the trumpet. Much like Lot in, in Sodom in Genesis 19, 11, 1, uh, 1 through 12. Our actions don't back up our words. Are you saved? Yes, I'm a Christian. Are you? Yes. I mean a real Christian. I don't talk about church going. I'm a real Christian. And see, when you say stuff like that, people think you're judgmental. I'm not trying to be judgmental. What I'm trying to say is there's a difference between a churchgoer and a Christian. Are you a Christ-like person? Are you a Jesus person? Are you, are you, are, can, they, can they look at you and say, man, it's hey, just like Jesus would. But are, you, are you that person that can stand there and, and take, take it? We're called to be the watchmen on the tower. We are that church. We are the church that needs to rise to every occasion. I need you to rise up, church, and be what God's called you to be. Get ready and get here early and pray. There doesn't have to be a special called prayer meeting. But folks act like if I don't call a prayer meeting, I don't want you to come and pray. Why are you crazy? There's eight Sunday school rooms back there. Find you a place. Get in the upper room. It's hot up there. Get in one of the classrooms and begin to call upon the Lord. Call on the Lord. Listen. We're called to be the watchman on the tower. We're that church. Get here early. Leave late. Be what God's called you to be. Let your hand find something to do. I said to Melissa before service, I said, you know, what really gets under my skin is that you don't have to be in charge of something to be part of something. You don't need a title to be part of something. You don't need a special engraved invitation to come pray. You don't need a special engraved invitation to do something that you see needs to be done. Somebody needs to get some ice. Somebody needs to get some ice and you don't need to be in charge of ice to get the ice. Just be the ice gatherer. Go get it. Bring it. If you all don't know what I'm talking about, as a sermon I preached a long time ago about getting the ice. It's just this. If you see something that needs to be done, go get it. Go do it. Don't ask the church to pay for it. You go get it. You do it. Amen. Go do it. Well, I'll get ice, but I can't afford that two fifty. So if the church will give me, a, I'll give the church a receipt for it. Well, it's raining. Oh, <laughs> Let your hand find something to do. Yes. Amen. Listen to me, and I don't make a lot of this. If you can't afford ice, I'm using ice as an example. Here's the deal. And something in your life needs to change. Yeah. Because my God is a blesser and not a curser. Amen. He blesses coming in and he blesses going out. He blesses my basket. He blesses my store. I'm the head and I'm not the tail. I'm above and I'm not the head. And if, I, listen, if, you're, if you're struggling, if 
You're struggling. I'm not, I, listen, I don't say the struggle is not real because I've been there. I've been there when I didn't have money to buy ice. I've been there. But I got sick of not having the money to buy ice. I got tired of being the one that wanted to do something, but I just couldn't afford it. Come on. I got tired of being the one. Everybody else is going to Mazio's. Honey, we're going to go home and eat sandwiches. Mm. Nothing wrong with going home and eating sandwiches. Right. You know what it teaches you to do? Yeah. It teaches you to trust God. <laughs> teaches you to trust God. Because let me tell you something. If you can't trust God now, when everybody's clapping and, giving and, 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 and shouting your name, you'll never know what it's like to trust God. Because if they exalt you, they can bring you down. But when God exalts you, when you understand that the only place, the only reason you're where you're at today is because God brought you to that place, when you understand that the only reason you're there is because God brought you there, when you understand that, when you spend some silent time with God, you can, listen, everybody can chant your name and tell you how beautiful and how wonderful you are. And it's just, thank you, appreciate it, but I know who brought me here. Amen. And so when those times are there, when you don't have money to buy ice, When you look in your wallet and there's ice money in it, you know who put it there. Shut up, folks. Hear me. I know where I have come. Yes. And it doesn't matter who says how wonderful you are. If you're grounded in God, you know exactly who you are. Amen. Don't despise those times of struggle. Come on. In all things, give thanks to God. That's right. Because in that struggle, you're learning how to trust God. I didn't say you won't be sad. I won't say your feelings won't get hurt. I won't say you won't be disgusted. I won't say you won't be upset. I won't say I don't. I won't say any of that stuff because it happens, and you're a physical human being, and you want to go do what everybody else wants, and everybody else is doing, and you know the bank account won't allow you to do that, and you know you have bills that are due, you got things going on, and you have to understand that God Himself is just trying to get you to a place that He can help you. Okay. You've been called out. And you've been brought out. I was called by God long before I was brought out by God. I was called by Him long before I ever did anything else for Him. I asked you a question this evening. And I want you to answer me as best of your ability. If you know a God like I've, been, like, like I've uh, said... <coughs> If I describe the God that you know, a God who gave you salt and a God who gave you light, a God that blessed you when everybody else didn't even consider you, can I share this? Honey, I'm going to share this. I'm going to share this. Okay. Was she in she was married to me when we were our first few years of marriage. We didn't have a lot of money. Okay? I worked hard. Uh, I believe God for blessing and showing me how to be a blessing and show me how to prosper. I would sit upstairs by myself room up here upstairs with VHS tapes. 
of, of messages that I recorded off TBN. Because I wanted to learn about seed offerings. I sat up there by myself for hours learning. Because I knew if it would work for them, it would work for me. Because God's no respecter of person. Even though I prayed this prayer before, it seems to me that, that He is. Seems to me, God, you respect your person. But all that time when I was in my ignorance and my youth, and I didn't understand what God was doing. One thing that we agreed on, we don't agree on a whole lot of stuff all the time, but one thing we agreed on. I'm not telling anybody our financial situation. I'm not going to lie and say I don't have any money when i got a savings account. We didn't have a savings account. We had one account. Broke account. What we had. There was no 401k. There was no IRA. There was no savings account. There was a checking account with no money in it. And if it hadn't been, you didn't have to have a balance in there. We wouldn't have had that. We would have had an envelope with money stuck in it. 50 cents or so. But we agreed not to tell anybody our business. Because if I'm truly going to trust God, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to manipulate you feeling sorry for me. So I can say what a blessing it was. I'm not going to have a Hagar in my finances. I'm not going to have an Ishmael grow out of my finances because I tried to do it myself. Oh, dear God in heaven. I didn't, listen, none of this is on this paper, but somebody needs to hear this. I wasn't going to have a Hagar and Ishmael come out of me trying to help God out. I wasn't going to manipulate the system. What I was going to do is I was going to give to God what God said give. I remember the first thousand dollar offering I ever gave. I remember the first hundred dollar offering I ever gave. Huh. Because when you go from level to level, you remember those things. I remember our first five thousand dollar offering we ever gave. Somebody needs to hear this. Because when you go from one level to the next level, you remember when you stepped across that threshold. Amen. Mm. Our next was a $10,000 offering. We're going to get to this year, I hope, maybe next year. So. We're working on it. But I didn't tell anybody our business. I just took it to God. Yes. And I found out, Brother Dean, I found out, Brother David, that though in my ignorance and I said, God, seems to me you're a respecter of person. Because I'd go up and I'd study and I'd write down scriptures and I'd read and I'd pray and I'd go back home and we still didn't have any money in the bank. I'd go and I'd read and I'd find out, listen, and listen, and for all y'all to do this, the Lord rebuke you and I hope that you get caught doing it. Somebody paying you cash, you don't report it to the government, I hope somebody busts you. You criminal and you thief. Oh, y'all shouting good when I'm talking about somebody else. I'm talking about me. Everybody shouting good. Because the Bible says to render unto Caesar, to render unto God what is. Boy, it got quiet now. I don't care if you agree. I'm not against you. I love you. I just want you to do the right thing. Because I want you to be blessed. And you can't be blessed with dirty money. Oh, boy. That's pretty depressing. Woo! Somebody better help me. It got quiet in here. My goodness gracious. You can't take dirty money and make it clean. That's right. Do what you're supposed to do with it, 
be a man of God. Be a person of God. Have integrity. Be what God's called. Listen, I know it's not the easy way, but it's the right way. Ain't nobody coming back next week, are they? <laughs> Ain't nobody coming back next week. Do it the right way. Don't run around with a tag on your back of your car that's been out since March. Yeah. We have thousands that do not know or think if there's anything better than what they have today, I'll go back on my sermon and I'll leave you alone. I'm sorry if I offended you. So there's a right way and there's a wrong way. We have a city that needs what you have. What do you have? A future. We need a city that believes in what you believe in. A future. How many believe that Jesus is coming? How many believe you're going? Sound of the alarm to warn of the coming different times. Hear me, I'm gonna quit. Feel like I made enough enemies. Look how much God trusts you. Look how much God trusts you to make you the watchman on the tower. You don't even trust yourself as much as God trusts you. <laughs> you have less confidence in you than God has in you. You really don't think that God can use you. But God says, I 
Jerry, give me a chance. Because when the watchman's on the tower, when the watchman's on the tower, and the watchman's ringing the bell, and the watchman's blowing the trumpet, when the watchman says, hey, something's coming, repent of it, get it out of your life. Ooh, Jesus. Look how much he trusted us to make us the watchman of this city, in a city in desperate need of a light, need of someone to show them the way to Christ, to warn them of the final days, to stand between heaven and hell for people that you don't even, to listen, stand between heaven and hell for people that don't even believe in what you believe in. Amen. They don't even believe in a hell, but you're trying to stand in the gap. They don't even believe in heaven, but you're trying to stand in the gap and blow a trumpet because you don't want to see anybody go to hell. I say it for an innumerable time that the city set on a hill we're a candle placed on a candlestick. We're the children of light. We are God's people. We are the watchmen of this city. Let us come together as a body and pray for God's divine wisdom and how to go where we have never gone before, to go further than we've ever gone, to reach higher than we've ever reached, to stand in the face of adversity and refuse to get off course, to let us, listen, listen, please let us go forward in the presence of God. I know we can make our mark on this city. Listen, take an enemy, take enemy hell territory. Stop the advancement of the devil in our city. This church is going to win and it's starting to, we need to start acting like we're going to win and stop being losers because by proxy. Come on, somebody! Yeah. I've delivered my soul. Giving you everything I've got. I want you to hear me. <coughs> Never my aim. To condemn you. It's always my aim to confront you. It's my aim to confront the evil in our lives. It's my aim to press Jesus in your face and make you deal with him. What you do after I preach what God's given me is totally up to you. You can change nothing and I'll love you just the same. You can change everything and I'll love you just the same. It makes no difference to me. But once I've given you Jesus, you have to do something with him. That's right. You can't walk away from him. I love the old thing. He's, he's, that's my king. When the, the line of the verse is this. You can't live without him and you can't outlive him. What are you going to do with him? You're winners. Every one of you are winners. Every one of you. Why you're a winner? Always have been a winner. That guy can play some basketball, man. My favorite people in the world. I just love that guy. I love his spirit. I love his heart. He made the decision, I'm going to go follow Jesus, and he never turned back. I love this man right here. One of my favorite people in the entire world. I think. I've known him in good times, and I've known him in bad times. And he's always been the same. He's always loved me. If anyone has ever seen me, he gave me a hug. Hey, Brother Jeff. And I've seen him when he was up, and I've seen him when he was way down. And I like him a whole lot better, and I like to see him when he's up. Because I know God's working in his life. I've seen Helen in the worst time of her life. And I've 
See her now. Y'all don't even know. We know. I remember. She's still here. She's still in church. She's still looking for an answer. You're all winners. Jan Farrell, one of my favorite people in our childhood. She's crazy. She drives me crazy. I love her. I love her. I can go to every one of you, and I know something about all of you. You're all winners. I watched this man right here work himself to death to build a business. And you just don't do that just because. Amen. I've watched him work himself to death. Him and his wife. Long hours in the hot sun to build a business. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of Paul. But you have to have something inside of you, Steve, to do that. Right. Not everybody does that. Not everybody do that. Because they don't want to put in the hours. They don't want to put in the time. They don't want to sacrifice. I was a sacrifice to build a business. I spent 15 years building one. Doing stuff I don't get paid to do. Spending money to do stuff for somebody else. I know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the same way we're building a church. I look around and I say, a bunch of winners. Zane's a winner. Les Cogburn, I've known that guy. I don't know how long I've known Les Cogburn. I can't remember meeting Les Cogburn. I've just known Les Cogburn. And I still slam him. up. <laughs> Inside joke, me and me and Les. <coughs> well, we used to work at Rhino there together. Right before then. Becky, I've, been, I've known Becky for 10 years, probably. I've seen her up. I've seen her way down. I've seen her happy. Like she is right now. I don't know how, she's Dave Matthew, but she's still happy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you understand where I mean? When I say you're a watchman on the tower? And why are you? Because you're a winner. You're a winner. I know you failed before. Did I not preach to you with every disappointment there's a Every time you've fallen short, God has given you a chance to be in His presence. I gotta quit here. I'm gonna preach again. I love it. It's never my aim to 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 uh, what was the word I used to condemn you. It's always my aim to confront you with Jesus. I have to do that. I can't tell you. Spring is here. I want you to be confronted with Jesus. I want you to do something with it. Stand here for you. 